Hey there, FMP 294 and 598. Matthew here. So we are going to look here just briefly at local variables, uh, modules, and then touch just briefly again on storage and what that might be good for and how we might continue to think about using some of these things. So we've talked about lots of different ways that we can hunt, uh, hold on to numbers, values, uh, any sort of kind of variable that we want to push around or grab different places inside of our network. Uh, and these are just uh, different ways that we can start to do some of those same exact things. And in fact, depending on the kind of efficiency that we're after, these, uh, this might save us some time in terms of uh, writing really complex references or getting or staying organized inside of complex networks. So without further ado, let's first look at uh, local variables, because variables are a really interesting kind of tool that we might use. Variables have, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't say that they're replaced by, but there's certainly a lot of things that variables used to be used for now that uh, storage is used for instead. Um, but this is a great way to kind of understand a little bit better what's happening in storage uh, in some ways. And it also gives us a sense of why storage is so incredibly powerful. So let's start um, by adding a new base. And the way that variables and modules work is that we need to put them inside of a base, and we need to call this base local. I like to give this a color, uh, like fuchsia, because this makes me this allows me to uh, see it easily. And then I'm going to split my view here just so that I can be in two places at once. We're going to go here inside of local, and we are going to add a null dat here to get started. And in this null, I'm going to call it variables. And then we're going to add a table. So the way that variables work, just like with storage, is that we need a key. We need something that we're actually uh, retrieving, or retrieving index, kind of, is a way to think about it. And then we need something that we're actually extracting. So let's take a look at what that might look like, right? We might, for example, uh, want to store integers. We might want to store floats. We might want to store strings. These are all things that we might want to extract at some point. So I am going to go ahead and give us three examples here. So we might have an example string, an example float, and an example integer. Okay, let's see. So if our string, I'm just going to put in hello for a float, let's say 1.55, and our integer, how about just 12. So, so far so good. This is, doesn't look too terribly thrilling yet. Uh, this begins to get exciting, however, if uh, out over here, or anywhere else, inside of our container uh, or project, uh, we start to evaluate those things. So we can use an evaluate dat as a kind of quick way to, to jump to these numbers or uh, the contents of what's going on over here. And here, the format for this is going to be me.var. So I'm looking for the variable, and then I need to put in the key. So for example, example string, ex string. And it helps if I spell that co uh, correctly. There we go. Ex string me dot var example string. Excellent. So there I've got my string. I could also go ahead and get out of this my float. Or I might also want to actually go ahead and grab that integer while I'm at it. Now this is all well and good, right? This is a lovely way for me to be able to set um, values that I want to have consistent access to. And in fact, because uh, of the way that variables work, local variables work, it doesn't matter what layer uh, we do a call for these. So for example, if we move here inside another base, and let's add another evaluate. And here in uh, our evaluate, we'll do the same thing, me.var. And in the variable, we'll go ahead and ask for our float again. It's evaluated the same way. If we were to add another base, 
and go inside this, we could repeat the same process. And voila, there it is. This is really handy because it means that we only have to put that uh, value one place. And then uh, it's a lot easier for me to remember a reference like uh, me.var than for me to think about some very complex pathway to get back to something. So let's think about what an example of that might look like. So let's go ahead and get rid of these. And let's add an LFO. Right. We might imagine that this LFO is driving any number of things inside of our network. And maybe this is actually driving um, multiple pieces of animation spread across the network in lots of different places. If that's the case, we might want to have the ability to select this, right? Because we know that we can use a select chop to be able to grab this. And in fact, selects allow us to grab operators at all sorts of different layers, right? So for example, if we were to use a base again, we were to go in here, and if we were to add a select chop, and we know that this chop is up one layer called LFL1, lo and behold, there we can grab it. And we don't even have to be uh, kind of wired together. We can just know the reference, and that'll get us to that LFO. Well, what happens if um, where this guy lives uh, starts to get more complicated, right? So we might imagine that uh, in some form of a network, we might have uh, a control module where those things live. And then to get to our LFO1, I've got to go up one, I've got to find control, and then I've got to know that it's LFO1. Now, if I start to build many more layers, this is going to get complicated very quickly. I'm going to start to write really long, um, messy kinds of pathways to try and figure out where something is. So we might use uh, our local variable to help us solve that problem, right? So maybe uh, what I want to use as a local variable is a kind of pathway. So let's look at what that might be. If I go ahead and edit the contents here again, and let's say that we just call this uh, LFO, right? And I know that the LFO that I want, in this case, I want to kind of track down uh, that LFO's absolute path. So in our case, that means that LFO lives in slash project one that lives inside of control and it happens to be LFO 1. So now that I've stored that pathway here as a variable, here inside of storage, let's go ahead and instead of this, for our select, let's write an expression. And I want the variable me.var. And I'm just going to go ahead and ask for LFO instead. So now I'm evaluating, or not evaluating, but I'm fetching this string to get me to that LFO. And this again, because I've written that uh, as an absolute path over here, means that I'm not stuck dealing with just um, this one layer, right? Like maybe here, let's add another base. We go inside of this base, and why not? We'll add one more. We've got a very deep, complicated network. I'm going to select again. And here in the select, I can use the same method to get to the, our LFO. It's going to be an expression, me.var. And the variable I'm looking for is called LFO. And lo and behold, that path is right there waiting for me. It's excellent. I'm thrilled with that. That's all well and good. But what happens if I have a slider? Right? We can imagine a world where maybe what I have uh, over here is I actually have a slider somewhere. Oops, not a select. But a slider or a button. And I want this slider, I want this value to be available anywhere. Uh, and I'd like to be able to grab that kind of quickly and easily without a lot of uh, futzing.
Well, let's go ahead and let's think about what we might do there. Now, I can't just kind of stick here into my table uh, a reference to that. That's gonna not going to work the way that I want it to. But I can evaluate it. Right? So, for example, let's go ahead and take this evaluate here. And for our evaluate, we're going to use the method um, of supplying tables to this thing. So let's go ahead and add a table. And in this table, we'll edit its contents. And we're going to say that I want a string called slider1. And that slider is actually going to be the operator that's a network above me in slider one and out one and out of that I'm gonna want the channel called V1. Now I can go ahead and plug this right into my evaluate and we can see here that I get those two values. Lovely, I get the float value that comes out of my slider and then I also get this very lovely title. Now how can I put all of these together? Well I could uh, do a handy trick here and just use a merge chap, merge stat, excuse me. And by merging these together, I've gone ahead and added slider right in here, which now means that if I were to add, let's say, a constant here, I could ask for me.var at the variable. It's called slider1. And there's my slider1 value. And in fact, I should be able to see that as I move this slider, it in fact drives this constant. And that wouldn't necessarily be what I would, uh, how I would implement this. I might instead think about if I had something like a movie file in. And maybe that's attached to a level top. And I'd like this level top Maybe I want its gamma to be driven by that. So me.var slider1. So now slider1 is controlling that. Right? This is a different kind of way of writing expressions um, that doesn't require that I uh, make the connection here by saying look up one, right? Because this could also be the expression the uh, that's the operator that's up one slider1, out1, v1. It's another way to write the same expression, but depending on how complex my network gets, this might be this might become cumbersome. And especially if this is a slider that I reuse frequently, um, then I might uh, find myself as in a situation where, in fact, I do, I want to use this module, or excuse me, this variable with method instead, me.var, slider1. So that's just one thing to consider here, right? And, and looking at that, we can see that we can uh, approach this one of two ways, right? We can uh, kind of hard code these values or we can evaluate values here uh, with our variables, which is excellent. I'm going to go ahead and call this variables. And I'm going to make another base. And we're going to call this one modules. And we'll look at how modules work here or let's just call it mods. So modules work in a similar kind of way as we might see with variables, but uh, there are a few things with modules that are, are a little bit different. So for example, let's go ahead um, and think about this for one moment. So one of the things that we need to do when we're working with modules is we need to add another base inside of locals, and we need to call that base modules. Again, I like to give them colors so that they're easy to distinguish. And we're going to go here inside of modules. All right. So in modules, we might run into some of the same kinds of uh, problems that we're having, right? So I might here in control have this LFO. And I'd love to be able to select that over here. And what I would like to not do is I would, uh, I would love to avoid this process of saying, go up one, find a thing called control, CTRL, 
And then in there, I want you to find LFO1. <sighs> right, that's, that's cumbersome uh, and can be a little bit like <sighs> fussy sometimes, right? So how could I do that instead here in modules? Well, here in my modules, I'm going to add a text stat. And in my text stat, I might call this one chops. And in chops, I'm going to go ahead and uh, define a, uh, a mod. Well, I'm going to define something here, right? Just like we do with Python all the time. And so I'm going to say that LFO is going to be equal to, and in this case, I'm going to use the whole path to get to it. So I know that that's in uh, project one, and I know that's in control. And then I know that it's LFO 1. Excellent. Now, over here, in writing my uh, expression, to use that module, I'm going to say me.mod, so modules. Then in modules, I'm going to want to look for the thing called chops. And then in chops, I want the thing called LFO. Oops, and clearly I wrote something wrong over here. Oh, of course, I need to make sure that this is a string. There we go. And I need to make sure that's an expression. Whew, details, heavens. So that's one way that I might think about doing this. Now, this also happens to be a little bit clumsy because it means that I'm forever trying to do this long pathway kind of writing. Um, and one way that I might think about kind of handling this in a different way is I might do something like, say, my p root, my project root, is equal to project one, right? That's this guy's name right here, project one. And I want to slash before this. So now, here instead of all of this business, maybe what I can do instead is I can say that I want p root plus this guy. Now that evaluates the same way. I can add strings together with Python. So this is a way that I'm assembling this whole string. But I only need to know uh, a portion of this. Right? So, for example, if I knew that uh, control was another thing that I was going to use consistently, I might define control as being slash uh, CTRL. And in this case, I would say I'd like the root plus control plus LFO1. Again, I'm adding all of those strings together to make this lovely little, uh, or lovely little reference over here. So that's a great way for us to think about how we actually extract some of these, uh, some of this information, right? And we can see that this is, you know, the more we really dig into how this becomes really powerful or useful. Um, really depends on seeing some of these things in action. So let's go ahead, let's go back to control here. Let's add some noise while we're at it. So I'm going to take this noise and I'm going to make it three channel noise. And here I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say that control is going to be project one slash control. And let's go ahead and fix this. So this is instead control. Excellent. We can see, hopefully, well, we'll see here in a moment. Hopefully that's still evaluating correctly. And I've got this noise one over here. So I'm going to go ahead and add noise to this process. So noise is going to be equal to control plus slash noise one. 
And I should now be able to see over here in my variables. Oops, wrong one. Over in my mods. Excellent. So we've got this up and running here. And we might see, uh, right, that with our select, let's add another select here. And in this select, let's go ahead and grab our noise. In this case, we actually go ahead and grab all of that noise. We're going to grab all three channels of that. Now, I might think about uh, over here in my modules, maybe what I want to do is I want to give those uh, channels some names, right? So maybe in this case, um, I want uh, to say that, uh, we'll call these this chan for channels, and uh, maybe I want soft to be equal to chan1, medium to be equal to chan2, and hard to be equal to chan3. Now, uh, here in my select, for my channel names, the channels that I'm selecting, I could say something like me.mod.chan.soft. And if I make sure that I evaluate that as ex an expression, I can see that that's converted into chan1. Right. On the same token, I could probably just take that, those same things and think about leaving them over here inside of chops. I wouldn't have to actually put this in a separate module. I could leave it here inside of chops. And instead of chan, we could uh, say that that's in chops. So that's one way that we might think about how we're actually extracting some of these things. Now, we could also go ahead and put um, integers, floats, and the like here as well into our module. So we might, uh, in this guy here, maybe we want to say that our uh, FPS is going to be equal to uh, 60. And over here, certainly, with a constant. And let's call this uh, presets. And this constant, I could go ahead and say that I want me.mod. I'd like the module called presets. And out of presets, I'd like FPS. And sure enough, there it is uh, waiting for me right out the gate. So with that in mind, we might think about how uh, modules can be really useful for us in terms of uh, grabbing a hold of uh, integers, floats, pathways, strings, all those kinds of things that uh, we use all the time when we're composing references and we're actually um, doing things here inside of Touch Designer. Another thing that we might think about uh, doing with modules that's a little bit more complicated and it's kind of higher level is uh, when we want to actually write something that's custom, right? We want to write a custom function that we're going to then call again and again and again. We can do that here um, inside of our modules. And let's look just at a really simple example of what that might look like. So I'm going to write a new function uh, over here. And I'm just going to call it simple. And we'll see why here in one second. So I'm going to define uh, my simple example. And in fact, you know what? Let's go ahead and do this in a text editor because that will be a little bit easier to work with. So I'm going to define my simple example. I know that I'm going to want to pass it two arguments, so I'm going to pass it a name and a number. In here, I want to print uh, Hello, and I'd like to go ahead and use a string that I'm going to pass through here. So hello string, it's nice to meet you. And I'm going to go ahead and pass in uh, the name argument that's coming in before. And then I'm also going to print, I see that you entered the number, and we'll pass in a digit here. And 
we'll go ahead and use number that we want to pass in. Excellent. So this is a you know a dead simple kind of um, example in terms of how we're going to actually implement this. Uh, and if we were to uh, run this, right, so let's go ahead and while we're at it, let's see what would happen. If we actually ran this function and we need to open up our text port and dialogues to see this. So over here I might say that I want a simple example, example to run and I need to give it a name like Matthew. Oh, well, hello Matthew. And I'm going to give it a number, 21. And we should see that when we run this, Lo and behold, hello Matthew, it's nice to meet you. I see that you entered the number 21. Lovely, great. So I can see that that works. What if I write something like this and I want to use it all over the place? I want to use it lots of different places inside of my network, but I don't want to constantly be in the position of having to copy and paste uh, in my function. I'd like something that, uh, I'd like to have a way of referencing this function, especially if I make something very complicated, um, wherever I am. And we can, in fact, do that. Uh, so let's look at a text dat over here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and add a table. And in this table, I am going to edit this real fast. I'm going to give it a name and a number. Excellent. And in my text, I'm going to go ahead and define those things. So name is going to be equal to the operator table one. And out of table one, I want uh, the one row. And I like the column called name. And number is going to be equal to the same thing. The operator, that's table one. And in table one, I'd like to use the first row, and I'd like to use the column number. All right, and then finally, here is the fun stuff. So here, now what we can do is we can say that I want me dot mod. I'd like the module that's called simple, right? The name of the module. And then finally, the name of the function inside of this. So simple example. And to simple example, I'm going to pass name and number. I'm going to pass name and number. Those are going to go in, into this guy. So let's see what happens when we bring our text part back. So now I can run this script. Oops, oh, I've got an error. That's excellent. Um, da, 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 da on line two. Oh, because I entered the wrong table. Table one. Excellent. So here we can see this printed out. Let's run that one more time. I run my script and lo and behold, there it is. Hello, Bill. It's nice to meet you. I see that you entered the number 32. And because that's all based off of this table, I could enter anything I want here in the table, right? We could think about how this might be an interface that I was working on it with. Uh, and changes to this table then are pushed to this function, which take advantage of the fact that it's actually uh, written way over here as a function um, inside of my modules. So that's one of those things that the more we start to take advantage of that, the more and more powerful that becomes. Uh, and it becomes really exciting uh, the more we kind of uh, fight with it and experiment with it. Okay, and the last thing that I want us to look at one more time is to look at storage. So we're going to uh, add one more container over here. We're going to close this. And we are going to add another base. And in this, uh, and we'll call this storage. So let's think for one second about some of the things that we already know about storage. We know that we can put uh, all sorts of exciting things into storage, depending on how we want to think about that, right? We, uh, we know that we can kind of put in um, 
single items because we've done things like this. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and add an examine here also so we can see what we're putting into storage. Dot dot means look at the, well, we want dot dot slash dot dot because I'm actually going to put this in my grandparent as a place where I'm going to store it. So here we might say me.parent2 for grandparent, store, and I want to store something like uh, X resolution, we've done this before, 1024. And if we run this script, we can see, lo and behold, we put that into storage, easy peasy. Okay, well, what if I want to put something uh, more exciting into storage than that? Uh, because certainly there are more exciting things uh, to put into storage. So for example, I might want to take something like noise. And let's take this noise uh, and let's, for fun games and profit, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn it way down. We're going to make it just maybe like one second long. Uh, I, that's even too much. So let's make it like 0.5 seconds long. And the reason I'm making it so short is I'm looking here specifically at the number of samples. So this has got 30 samples in it right now. So uh, let's go ahead and um, take this text. We'll recycle it because there's plenty of things we can take advantage of here. And here I want to store noise. I want to put that into storage and uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to ask for the operator that's called noise1. So in this case what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and put this whole operator into storage. Right? So what happens if I start to think about doing that? So if we do that, let's go ahead and run our script here. We can see here, lo and behold, I have put this thing, TD Noise Chop, into storage. And I don't quite understand what that means. Okay, well, what if I add a constant? And what if I try to fetch that, right? Okay, it won't let me fetch noise. Okay, I'm not quite sure why. What does it tell me? Okay, so it tells me that I'm asking for a class, this noise chop. Hmm. And I'm expecting a float value. Well, let's go ahead and take one moment, and we're going to delete this constant, and we're going to instead add a select. And we should see here in the select is that if we ask for... If we look to fetch noise one, or just noise, excuse me, lo and behold, I'm fetching that because what I'm actually storing is I'm storing this path. That's actually what's living here right now. So what happens if I want to take all the values that live inside of uh, this and put those into storage? Right, so here, let's go ahead and let's specify that I want to put Chan one into storage. Now we should see something a little bit different happen. So if we run this script, we can now see that what I've done is I've ended up putting every single value that's inside of this into storage. I've also got, uh, oh, oh right, I did a little mistake here. Let's call this noise chan1. And we'll run this script one more time. So we'll leave this stored uh, as noise, and we'll store this now as noise chan1. So now I can see that I've got every single sample from this put into storage. And, and that's really exciting. In fact, if we go and do something uh, crazy like let's animate this, We can see that in animating that even, uh, that's actually updating the values that are in storage because of the way that that's actually held right now, which is cool. That's cool in lots of exciting ways.
We can also do something really interesting when we're fetching. So for example, if we, let's use an evaluate dat for this. So in our evaluate dat, we might uh, say that we want me.fetch. I'd like to fetch the thing that's noise chan one. Uh, and in fetching noise chan one, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab that um, value. We'll see once we run here to the end of the timeline and come back, we'll see moving values again, right? Because we just have samples that are working right there. And in fact, I think that we have hold here set. And if we said uh, cycle, we'd see those things just keep going. Right, so this is interesting. Uh, what's more interesting about this is that not only can we go ahead and sample uh, this whole thing, right? So we can get this whole um, kind of array that comes out, that gets spit out as we chug through the timeline. We might instead ask that we want a specific sample out of this. So for example, if I ask for uh, the sample that's in the 10 position, we can see that now I'm actually just grabbing this number right here. So the number that's just in the 10 position. I can do this also with uh, surface operators. I can do this with tables. I can begin to do all sorts of really interesting uh, and clever things here uh, with storage that I wouldn't be able to do uh, with uh, variables or with modules without a lot of extra legwork. So let's look at one final example that I think is really fun and interesting. Uh, and then we will call it a night. Okay, so the last example that I want to look at is how we might use something like a dictionary in storage. So we need a text dat and we need a table dat. Dictionaries are fascinating. They're really a, a lovely Python convention and they let us do all sorts of really interesting things. Um, and they're formatted just like a lot of things with pairs. So we have a key and then we have a value. So we might have something like apple, orange, pear, and maybe kiwi. And let's go ahead and add another column. And we're going to put some values in here. So for example, I might want like 10, 11, 100, and 6. Excellent. So what I'd like to do is I would like to go ahead and put these guys into storage, right? If I put this table into storage, I'm not really putting the table into storage. I'm only putting a reference to it into storage. And I'd actually like these things to live over here. And I can do that with a dictionary. So here I'm going to say that I want uh, fruit to be a new empty dictionary. And I use the curly brackets for that. So I need to know a few things as I do this process. Uh, so first, I'm going to say that my f table uh, is equal to the operator. Oops. That's table one. And then I also need to know the length. So I'm going to say f table len. And I want to know the length of, or the range of that. So I'm going to take the range of my f table. And this is, I'm doing this because I'm going to write a for loop. Uh, and I need to have a range uh, to do a for loop in the way that I want to for this particular example. Okay, so for t in, uh, in f table len. So for each one of those, what I want to do is I would like fruit, my dictionary here, to be appended in the following way. First, I want a, a string that comes out of F table and the T position and the zero position. So as we run through this loop, right, so the first one will say zero, one, two, three, subsequently. So in zero, I want you to find this guy, and I want you to, that to be the key. All right, and then I would like to set that to be defined to F table. Again, I'm looking back at my table here. And I want to, again, the corresponding row, and this time I want column one. 
Excellent. And last but not least, we're going to put this into storage. And this time we're going to say that me dot parent, this is grandparent store. I'm going to call this one fruit live. And I'm going to go ahead and put fruit in there, right? So fruit live is what we're going to call it. We're going to put in this dictionary that we've just made. Hopefully we've written all this correctly. Let's run this script. Oh, we messed something up. What did we mix up? Oh, right. So let's decode this one last time. So um, what I'm saying is, I want this thing called fruit to be my dictionary. I'm defining this table up here as being this thing that I'm calling F table, short for fruit table. I need to know the range of that. I need to know the, uh, how long it is, how long I'm going to run my for loop. In this case, I'm looking for the range um, of my number of rows. So that's going to return uh, a start position and an end position in terms of the range. And then I'm going to go ahead and run this for loop. And what happens is for every single one of my rows here, I'm going to take the f uh, item in the zero column, and that will be a key. And then I'm going to take the things in the one column, and those will be a value. And then I'm going to put that into storage. And I'm calling that live because I can see over here that I'm actually referencing a cell. And in referencing a cell, that means that if I update this, so for example, if we watch our orange value here, if I change it in uh, my table, I change it in storage. And if I evaluate for that, so for example, if I uh, go ahead and say me.fetch, I want to fetch fruit live. Well, that will give me the whole kit and caboodle. I can also, uh, with some brackets here, I can specify that I want just orange. And now I get just 22. But because this is live, if this value changes, uh, this gets all pushed around. Okay, so what if I want something to be frozen, right? So let's look at what that might look like. So in that case, I'm going to go ahead and use everything I just used. I'm going to call this frozen instead. And now instead of just referencing the cell, I'm just going to uh, make sure that I ask for an integer, right? An integer value of what's in the cell. And now when I run this script, we can see that I've got my live dictionary down here. I've got a frozen dictionary here. And this one now, uh, as an integer, isn't going to update. So when I update this one, it's going to update my live dictionary, but it doesn't update my frozen dictionary. So let's look at orange uh, specifically. And so we'll look at, we'll compare live and frozen. So we should see uh, the value here will change, but our value here won't change. And depending on what we're doing, this might be a really handy way for us to differentiate between the kinds of information that we want to hold on to in storage. Okay, so that's a bunch of crazy wild um, kinds of thoughts about how we can think about uh, modules, variables, and storage. These are all really handy things for us to have access to. And I am excited to see how you take advantage of these different types of tools in your next project. All right, happy programming, everybody.